All right. And we're going to be in First Chronicles 29, verse 1. First Chronicles 29, and, it, and it's one of my favorite passages. And it's the anointing, and, uh, the anointing of Solomon as king by David toward, his, toward the end of his life. And it's remarkably kingdom-focused, as you'll see. So it's First Chronicles 29, verse 1. And I don't really have a title for the message tonight. But uh, can you guys still hear me okay? Yes. Okay. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 1. Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon my son, whom alone... God has chosen, is yet young and tender. And the work is great, for the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now, I'd like to just sort of help preface this and help prepare your thoughts as we go into this. Now, regardless of the things that Solomon went through, his name does mean peace, and he is, like David, in, in, in many ways, a type of Christ. And I think you'll see this. The building of the house of God shows forth the church in so many beautiful ways. And Solomon shows forth Christ in so many ways. And in the chapter afterward, the Queen of Sheba shows forth the Gentiles in so many ways. But we'll read through here, starting at 1 Chronicles 29, verse 2. And this is David talking. Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God, the gold for things to be made of gold, the silver, things of silver, brass for brass, iron for iron, wood for wood, onyx stones, and any stones to be set, glistering stones and of diverse colors and all manner of precious stones and marble stones in abundance. Now, as we remember, Peter says that you all are living stones building up the house of God. And the stones he's talking about are not rocks. He's talking about gems, precious gems. And frequently throughout the Bible, God's people are likened unto gold and silver and precious stones and trees and just expensive things things that are in the temple. And in the Old Testament, they're called vessels. And in the New Testament, the Bible calls us vessels in the house of God. And so when it speaks of stones and vessels and gold and silver, I believe that this is a type of the church and that Solomon, whose name means peace, is a type of Christ. And it says, and all these precious stones and marble stones in abundance. You know, the Bible speaks of the church being built up and Gentiles coming in. And it says that they have to remove the stakes. And remember that one passage, the place is too narrow for me. You remember that? And uh, because so many Gentiles would come in. Moreover, verse 3, because I have set my affection to the house of my God. Now, I want you all to think about that for a moment. The Bible says, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. And that's in Colossians. I believe it's chapter 3. Set your affection on things above. That is, we set our affection on the church and Christ. You know, some people throw around the phrase, oh, he's too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. And that's impossible. When we are heavenly minded, we are the best earthly good. Amen. Because we have the mind of Christ, which is rooted and grounded in love. And so when David here says, I set my affection toward the house of God, this is really can be seen as Christ saying, I have set my affection toward the house of God. I have 
Jesus says, I believe, of my own proper good, of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. And so we see two things. We see David setting his affection. He's a man after God's own heart. And anyone who has a heart after God will have a heart not just for God, but for God's house. As the Bible says, if we claim to love God but hate our brother, we're a liar. In other words, to love God, you will love the house of God, God's people. You will love them. And so David, in another place in Psalm, he says, if Jerusalem is not my chief joy. Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. In other words, what he's saying, if the house of God, you know, he said in Psalm 42 and 43, I went to the house of God for joy. And that is we need one another. Yes. And so David said, if I do not prefer Jerusalem above my chief joy, let my tongue cleave to my mouth. In other words, what he was saying is, let my mouth be stopped. Let me be unable to speak anything if I have not preferred God's people above my chief joy. And we need to think about our chief joys. Yes. Whatever our joys are, God's church, God's people are to be as important to us as they are to him. Amen. And so when David here says, I have set my affection." We see David's affection toward God and his house, which is a type of Christ and his affection toward God and his house. The Bible says in Hebrews 3, Jesus was faithful in all his house as Moses was. And we also see a pattern for us that we are to set our affection toward God's people. Affection. You know, when we think about affection, we we think of all of our desire. And when it does say that David had a heart after God, he was passionate for God. He was passionate for God and he was equally passionate for God's people. And so verse three is so important to our kingdom hermeneutic. Because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have of my own proper good, of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God, over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. In other words, what he's saying is everything that God has given me, I have so much and more to devote to the house of God. Even 3,000 talents of gold, and the boys and I were looking this up, and a talent of gold is somewhere from what I understand, about 75 pounds. Wow. The 3,000 talents of gold, the gold of Ophir, which was known to have great quality gold, and 7,000 talents of silver to overlay the walls of the houses. The gold for things of gold, verse 5. The silver for things of silver and for all manner of work made by the hands of artificers. And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? And we we see so clearly the temple of God, that all of us are members. Feet, eyes, nose, mouth, hands. And that we serve the house of God. No man is an island. Man who separates himself meddles with all wisdom. Very important. That is, we we interfere with wisdom when we isolate ourselves. And I can't tell you uh, how important that is to me as I went through a three-year period where I did separate myself. And uh, while I learned a lot during that period, it was damaging emotionally. And uh, as far as my security went, I I was very... uh, You know, when you separate yourself from God's people, we don't have them to bear our burdens. And we're not bearing their burdens. God has designed us to bear and share. Remember that. To bear and share. 
And that's what creates unity in the body of Christ. Bearing and sharing without gossip and judgment. Bearing and sharing without gossip and judgment. In verse um, 6, the chief of the fathers and princes of the tribes of Israel and the captains of thousands of hundreds with the rulers of the king's work offered willingly. And as we get into this, I want you to think about this willing, willingly offering. It's not mandatory offerings. Uh, it, it is beyond that. It is a, an offering out of everything we have, whatever it is, not just finances, but everything we have is to be devoted willingly. Even in, in 2 Corinthians, when Paul spoke about giving to the ministry, it was always out of a, a willing heart, not grudging. Give according as God has given you, out of a willing heart. People always ask me, you know, they're always asking me about the tithe, and I say, of course not. Of course, we're not under the tithe. We're under a better covenant. And I had to really sit back and think about that. The tithe is easy. Yeah. Right? But we're in a better covenant. Amen. So we're not just giving of our finances. We're giving of our lives and our love and our forgiveness and mercy. That's well to die daily. Yeah. And so they gave the, uh, thousands of hundreds with the rulers of the king's work offered willingly, not by command, as the law of Moses said, but willingly. They gave for the service of the house of gold 5,000 talents and 10,000 drams and of silver, 10,000 talents, brass, 18,000 talents, 100,000 talents of iron. And they with whom precious stones were found in other words, those who had all these precious stones, it says they gave them to the treasure of the house of the Lord. Sort of implying that those who were wealthier, that is with the gems, the priceless gems, they gave to the house of the Lord by the hand of Jehiel, the Gershonite. And apparently he was sort of this moderator. And it says, look at the result of this devotion to the house of God. Look at this result. And this is what happens when we forgive and are merciful and devote our whole heart willingly to God's people. Verse 9, the people rejoiced. Why? For that they offered willingly because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. So what we're seeing here, you know, the Bible says he will rejoice over us with joy and with singing, Zephaniah 317. And so I believe, I personally believe that when God sees us exercising the mercy he's given to us, devoting our lives to God's people, I believe it brings Christ joy. I believe it makes our Savior smile. Therefore, David, verse 10, blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. And this is one of my most favorite passages in the Bible. And it really just kind of, uh, it puts us in our place and yet brings great delight. Okay? Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom. O oh Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. The Bible cry, calls Christ the head of the church, and it says, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Therefore, God also has what? Highly exalted him. Mine. This is Jesus. Both riches, listen to this, whatever your socioeconomic financial status is, 
both riches and honor come from you. Yes. Okay, so take this practically and take this spiritually. I can't even, you, you can't even begin to imagine what Paul means by riches in the book of Ephesians. I think he mentions the word riches five or six times. And he says the riches are the spiritual blessings. And so he says both riches and honor come from you and you reign over all. Yes. In your hand is power and might. And in your hand, it is to make great and to give strength to all. Apart from me, you can do nothing, Christ says. The prayer of Hannah, we've talked about it before, and the prayer of Mary. It is God's hand who gives, it is God's hand who takes away, Job. It is God, God's hands who makes great. Now, therefore, our God, therefore, in other words, in light of what we just said, <laughs> power, greatness, glory, victory, majesty. You own everything. The kingdom is yours. You're exalted as head over all. Grit, riches and honor come from you. You reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, in other words, in, in light of everything I just said about your power, majesty, honor, giving these things to us, we thank you. And we praise your glorious name. That's Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. At the name of Jesus. Yes. This is Jesus. Jesus is the manifestation of God. We didn't know that under the Old Testament. But wow. Jesus has revealed him. And he says, he that honors the Son honors the Father. I am here. I am Emmanuel. God with us is what it means. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. Now, watch this next verse. This is just, uh, it is pride shattering, but at the same time, it will make you smile. But who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly wow. after this sort? Wow. For all things, in other words, all the things that we're offering come from you. Yeah. And of your own have we given you. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. I mean, he's, he's basically saying we're so excited to give. We're offering willing, willingly, but wait a minute. Who are we to even be excited about giving these things because everything we're giving, you own? <laughs> I mean, this, this passage should just uh, lift our spirits. However, there's one big, big difference. And you'll see it in verse 15. For we are strangers before you and sojourners. Ephesians chapter 2 at the end. You are no longer strangers. Yes. And yeah. You are fellow citizens of the household of God. Isn't that beautiful? Man. And so we, we mark that, we note that, that here's David, this incredible type of Jesus, this incredible type of the house of God, the church, but we are strangers and sojourners, as were all our fathers, Hebrews 11. These all died in faith, having not received the promise, God having provided some better thing for us. As were all our fathers, our days on the earth as a shadow, in contrast to Christ, has brought light in immortality, life in immortality to light through the gospel. We have immortality. Their days were as a shadow. That's right. And there is none abiding. And he put himself in there. He acknowledged, read Psalm 30. It's a devastating psalm, actually. Devastating. Because he said, 
that there is no remembrance of you in the pit. There's no celebration, Isaiah 26. But in this new covenant, we have immortality and eternal life. And the Bible says, again, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. We have everlasting life. And as Jesus said, he who lives and believes in me will never die. Amen. Verse 16, O Lord our God, all this store we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name comes of your own hand <laughs> and is all your own. Now, of course, remember, they're building the house, right? They're offering up these things to build the house. Well, how then do we interpret this? Into Obviously, I mean, this is very clear. Anything that we have, whether it's our bed, our clothing, our shelter, our books, <laughs> everything we have is the Lord's. But now how does this apply to us in regard to our service of the people of God in the house of God in this kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God? How does it apply? I think what God is telling us here is Hebrews 13, that everything we do is performed by the power of God. Anything we do to serve the house of God willingly, all of our happiness, all of our joy, all of our forgiveness, all of our mercy, all of our love, our compassion, our tenderheartedness, what God is saying is, all these things that we offer to God's people come from the hand of God, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. All our works, that's Philippians 2.13, Isaiah 26, 12 and 13, all our works are worked in God. They're all done. Now the God, that great shepherd of the everlasting covenant, make you do that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Mm -hmm. so this is where I sit back and I say, oh my gosh, everything, all this store that we've prepared to build you a house for your holy name comes of your own hand and is all your own. My works, I mean, it starts with our righteousness. You know, the Bible says he gives us a crown of righteousness. And they lay their crowns down at feet of Jesus. Why? Because they recognize that any crown any work, any good deed, any love, any demonstration of the mercy of Christ, it all comes from the hand of God. It's his own. Amen. And therefore, we can get to the end of the day and begin the beginning of the day and say, Lord, any mercy that I will display, any gift and love and compassion and profound devoted heart to your house comes from you. And this is important because we resign from ourself. We resign from our power. We, we do. We have to sit back and say, Lord, nothing, again, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Right. And that's true with everything. I know, verse 17. I know also, my God, that you try the heart and you have pleasure in uprighteousness, in, in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered these things. And now I have seen with the joy of your joy, your people, which are present here to offer willingly unto you. And this could very well be Jesus speaking. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination. Listen to this. Keep this. He acknowledges that we need the power of God to create the thoughts of him and his people. We need it. He says, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of your people and prepare their heart unto you you know frequently if you look in the kings some of the godliest men and women the bible says they prepared their heart to seek the lord now that may sound strange i remember the first time i read that i was i was like what 
prepared their heart to seek the Lord. And I believe what the scriptures are telling us is this. They actually thought before they sought the Lord, they thought about what they had. They thought about what they're about to do. They thought about the fact that everything they're about to offer unto the Lord comes from the Lord. Does that make sense? They didn't just go into it with a human-centered idea. This idea that somehow, well, I'm going to raise myself. I'm going to stir myself up to the Lord. No, they're like, wait a minute. All I do for God comes from God. All I offer to God. Everything I give to God's people, how I treat God's people, it all comes from the power of God. Apart from me, you can do nothing, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <clears throat> and so that's why it says, keep this in the imagination of their heart. How often do we pray that? Lord, keep your people in my imagination, in my heart. Keep your glory, your praise, your strength, your power in the imagination of my heart. Prepare my heart for you. And then give unto Solomon, my son, a perfect heart to keep your commandments, your testimonies, your statutes, to do all these things, to build the palace for the which I have made provision. Remember, David couldn't build it because he was a man of blood. And David said to all the congregation, now bless the Lord your God. Man, if there's any message that a minister should give to God's people, it is this. Bless the Lord your God. Yeah. And what did the congregation do? They blessed the Lord God of their fathers and bowed down their heads and worshiped the Lord and the king. <laughs> And they sacrificed sacrifices unto the Lord, burnt offerings unto the Lord on the next day after that day, even a thousand bullocks, a thousand rams, a thousand lambs with their drink offerings and sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. And watch this. This is beautiful. And this is that joy that we have in Christ. And they did eat and drink before the Lord on that day with great gladness. Everything they did was before the Lord. It was as if they were, when they would do something for the people of God, it was, God, I'm doing this for you. This, this display of mercy, this display of forgiveness, this person who is hurting, this prayer for the needy, this prayer for healing, this person is sick. God, I am praying for this person for you. Not for me. I just had one of my former students just sent me a text book, a text message through Facebook. And a lot of students on Facebook. It's kind of cool. And this one, she's a mother. I think she's going through some tough stuff. And she says, can you pray for me? I'm going through migraines. And I've got these migraines that can't figure out what it is. I'm sitting there going, God, me. of course I will, you know. But I really had to think to myself, am I doing this for her to be proud of me that I'm praying for her? Or am I thinking to myself and before God, Lord, I want to pray for her for you, before you, to my audience of one, Jesus. I mean, that's the most important thing any worship leader could, you know, could really come to a conclusion about. When a worship leader, you know, when she gets before all these people or he gets before all these people and plays these songs, man, it's so easy to get caught up in the performance and the music and, the, you know, the, all that. But imagine, imagine uh, Asaph. Anybody remember Asaph? He was David's music oh, yeah. director. And imagine truly leading God's people in worship, not for the show, not for the rock stardom, but... Lord, I'm doing this for you, and I'm pointing. Go to him. Him. Point all your affection. Set all your affection toward Jesus. And they did eat and drink before the Lord on that day with great gladness. And they made Solomon, the son of David, king the second time, and anointed him unto the Lord to be the chief governor and Zadok the priest. 
Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David, his father, and prospered. And all Israel obeyed him. And all the princes and the mighty men and all the sons likewise of King David submitted themselves to Solomon the king. And the Lord magnified Solomon exceedingly in the sight of all Israel and bestowed upon him such royal majesty as had not been on any king before him in Israel. Thus David the son of Jesse reigned over all Israel. And the time that he reigned over Israel was 40 years. Acts says he served his own generation. Seven years he reigned in Hebron, and 30 years, 33 years he reigned in Jerusalem, and he died in a good old age, full of days, riches, and honor. And Solomon his son reigned in his stead. Now the acts of David the king, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Samuel the seer, the book of Nathan the prophet, and in the book of Gad the seer, with all his reign and his might, and the times that went over him, and over Israel, and over all the kingdoms and countries. You know, the Bible says, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. We have David clearly displayed. He did everything with all his might, all of his passion. We see Solomon doing that for a large portion of his life. Everything with all his might, all his passion. You know, we talk a lot about passion today. But what does it mean, actually, to do all heartily as unto the Lord? I think we see the greatest demonstration in the cross. Jesus did everything with all his might and with all his heart. He did it wholeheartedly. He did it heartily as unto the Lord. He laid down his life for his people as unto the Lord, as an offering as a sin offering, as a burnt offering, as a peace offering. He fulfilled it all and said, I do this for you. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And what did he do? He built up the house that is filled with precious stones, which stones we are. Amen. Amen. I didn't even have to meet you guys. I know, that was a surprise. Normally, y'all are talking and sending notes to each No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm throwing spit wads. Show of throwing spit wads. My former days as a teacher. Anyway, <laughs> isn't that a beautiful wow. chapter? Right. Yes, it is. Yes, it, is. Yeah, it is. It, it really is. You know, um, until um, Adrian and Danny got me a new Bible because my cat ate a lot of my pages, and because my first Bible was missing Samuels and Chronicles. This is just so refreshing because I noticed it was missing those books. I never knew that when I first became born again. I mean, this is so special. I, I just never realized how beautiful, <clears throat> totally, totally beautiful that the, you see the sovereignty of God in these. Verse 18. Oh my goodness. I mean, I just started crying. I, I just, I, 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 I'm beside myself. Uh, well, Rain, also verse 18 that you mentioned that. Yeah. Remember, that's the, that's the counteract to Jeremiah. The imaginations of man's heart is evil continually. So the sovereign God has to change the imaginations to righteousness. Yeah. That's what really sticks out there. That's mm -hmm. really good. That's good, good stuff. And you know what Ward said? Um, we interfere with wisdom when we isolate ourselves. Yeah. I was just actually, I'm so, oh my goodness. This is like an answer to, well, this is not an answer to prayer. This is a wake up call for me because I was just going to go into hibernation. Seriously, mm -hmm. I was going to go into hibernation um, right after this study. And, and a few of you know why, but um, no, I'm not going to do that now. I'm not yeah. going to do that now because I'm going to bear and share. <laughs> hey, there you go. Amen. <laughs> cool. I like the, uh, I, I, I love that, uh, that whole passage. Um, and it's it's a beautiful one to memorize too. It's one that I memorized a long time ago that 
um, I, I pull out uh, in, in a lot of times. And I, the, the word picture I, I see when I, when I think of uh, total depravity in, the, um, in Calvinism is, uh, is us lifeless in the swamp and God's strong arm reaching in and pulling us out of that swamp. There's nothing, I, I had no part in that. I, I had no strength in that. It was God's strength that pulled me out. Yeah. Um, and and there, that, that's the, the power of that, uh, that, uh, that verse. But wow. Yeah, that whole passage is just is completely about God's, God's sovereignty. Yeah. It really is. It's it's beautiful. It's and what's cool is the stone play, the stones, the gems. Yeah, you find that in the Garden of Eden, and then you find it in the Book of Revelation when the covenant's here. Yeah, <clears throat> those gems, the onyx, and all those things that were there. Yeah, you sure do. I was talking to my boys about that. How Revelation describes, you know, the city is with all these stones and built upon. What is it called, Jesus? The the, the Jasper, right, right. I can't Jasper, remember. Jasper, Sardis, and uh, pearls. Yeah, yeah. It's just amazing. It's not just. In other words, I was telling my boys, it's not just you're living stones, a bunch of rocks. Right. No, he's like, man, y'all are jewels. Yeah, we're living, breathing. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And and remember the priest in the Old Testament, he had. He had this ephod, and on that ephod were all these stones that represented the children of Israel. You know, Ward, um, when you were mentioning that all things come from him, which we understand that, um, I guess I was thinking about, I don't know, or, or, am I saying it right, so, uh, Anais or Sapphira or whatever in the first century, where they held back. They held back the, uh, the, the price of the land or whatever. Thing, and I just thought all things come from him. So really what they were doing was smacking God in the face. Right? Because they would have known all things come from him. Or am I on the wrong track? Oh, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, and because I used to read that and go, oh, my gosh, how much have I kept back, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a dead man. No. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think the issue is exactly what you're saying, is that their heart was, uh, it was deceptive. It was trying to convince the people that they were giving so much that their heart was not willingly giving it. It was to be admired and adored by the people, much like, you know, uh, I believe it was King... Uh, was it Herod who was eaten by worms? The Bible said he's a the voice of a God. Right. And he was eaten by worms because he did not give glory to God. And I'm not saying that God does that to everybody because obviously I've preached messages in my life where I received, wanted to receive anyway, lots of glory and God, <laughs> and God, he was merciful. But I think what God was trying to do was tell us uh, a principle yeah. The principle that everything we have comes from God and that Herod was to ascribe all glory and honor to God. He could have been a great orator, but he was to ascribe glory to God. Instead, he received it for himself. Remember, it says the voice of a God, right? That's what they said. The people said the voice of a God. Well, he was eaten of worms because he received the glory. However, when the people looked to Paul and Barnabas, they bowed down and worshiped them. And Paul and Barnabas said, do not do that. We yeah, they ran away from them. They lost. They were free. Yeah. Was that, Danny? I said, they ran away from them. Then, oh, no, we ain't gods, man. Don't be, don't be <laughs> Yeah, bad. I don't want to be eating the worms. No. <laughs> the lightning's on its way. I'm out of here. Right, right. You know what you bring out, Ward, in this, uh, of course, having a heart to love God and to love his people. I keep thinking of in Romans when our natural condition, it says, uh, is to be an enmity with God. Not just not the believer, I mean, not just not unbelievers, that's believers. We're all that way. We're no better from the same lump. And to go from that, that's an amazing transformation wow. that's wrought by the hand of God. And they're, they're getting this sovereignty, which 
And property, I believe property understood uh, ought to make our hearts glad. And that is the doctrine of God's sovereignty and mm -hmm. coupled with our total inability because what more can uh, humble us in the dust and yet glorify God? Uh, it's just amazing that uh, you, you had a good, uh, this is very good tonight, which you, which you uh, brought, brought to us. Really. Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. You know, let me say something just on the, on the, that, that topic of God's sovereignty. You know, there are a lot of people and you know, like what, what Dana had mentioned, you know, they, um, they refer to themselves as Calvinists. Um, but unfortunately, you know, yes, if you were to look at our view, we share a similar view of God's sovereignty that, you know, the, the, the Puritans had. But I think the thing that has the effect on people that we're looking for is that they see our view of the sovereignty of God resulting in joy, resulting in gratitude, yeah. resulting resulting in an evangelical, uh, merciful, kind-hearted, um, passionate spirit. And unfortunately, if you go back and look at a lot of, quote, Calvinism and believers in the sovereignty of God, unfortunately, there, there is a lot of deadness. There's, there's, a, there's almost a spirit of, um, they're almost sullen, you yeah. know, uh, kind of morose. I don't know. They're lackadacious. They're lackadacious. Yeah, yeah. The spirit of, of punishment. Of God. Yeah, there is. There's, there, there's a lot. And, and isn't that fascinating that if you look at the stream of both Calvinism and Protestantism after the time of the Lutheran Reformation, there was a very heavy spirit of legalism, whether it was down the road of Wesley or down the road uh, of Calvin. You know, it, there, there was a, a heavy burden. And yeah. I think there's, there's something that was missing in all of that. I, I give God thanks for the Protestant Reformation, obviously. But, yeah. but there was something missing in there. Yeah. And I think the spirit of the kingdom of God yeah. may be that. The spirit of mercy. The, you know, the Bible says, you know, uh, Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to do justly, which means fair, no judging. That's what that means. To do justly doesn't mean let's establish justice and punish the evildoers. No, it's not even along that mind frame. It is to do justly. We're, be just. You know, don't, the Bible says that Jesus did not judge by the hearing of his ears or the seeing of his eyes, but he judged righteous judgment. That is, he understood what was in man. And that's why the Bible says he did not commit himself to any man because he knew what was in man. And so we have to do justly to love mercy and to walk humbly. And that's one of the things we don't see in a lot of Wesleyanism and a lot of Calvinism is we don't see walking humbly and loving mercy. Instead, you have on the one side of Arminianism, you have the spirit of uh, legalism, trying to sustain salvation. And then on the side of Calvinism, you have the spirit of legalism trying to prove your salvation. You see? Right. Really? Wow, yeah. Scripture yeah. is, no, we're, we're called to, yes, acknowledge the sovereignty of God. Everything we have, our salvation, our faith, our good deeds, everything, but to be humble in doing it. You know, uh, Ward, in they that not, really wrapped up in those attitudes. The Sermon on the Mount really wraps up the spirit, not the letter, the spirit of what the law really was. Yeah. You know, yeah. blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed yeah. are the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So yeah. forth, et cetera, et cetera. Amen. Yeah. And Calvin, Calvinism, when, when I came to Calvinism from Arminianism, I, I, uh, I, I watched a debate and I saw that just the piles and piles of scripture that were, that were on the, the Calvinist side and, uh, and the, the free will side, you know, it just fell apart. And so, so I became a Calvinist and, and, uh, and, and focused on that. And, and then years later, I just started to see that, see Calvinism, the, the insufficiency of Calvinism. Um, mm. I, I wasn't seeing, it seemed like 
And, and John Kelvin himself was an awful man. He was, he, he yeah. had someone jailed for naming his son John wow. after him. And uh, he, he was uh, incredibly oppressive. He would just, I can tell, tell stories, but, um, but, and I, and I think that uh, part of that comes from, you know, John Calvin, which he really got from Augustine. But um, the thing that's missing in all of that is relationship. Right. And, um, is uh, relational delegation in God's heart. He wants, he wants to delegate to us, like kind of like a, um, a father uh, teaching his son to drive. He's, he, he wants his son to be able to do what he can do. And he wants to delegate that, um, not, to, uh, not to, you know, give full power and control to, to the son, but he wants to share the joy of, of um, the relationship value of empowering his son. Yeah. Kind of like the, the, uh, um, the, the Sermon on the Mount is, all, all those things are empowerment for the people right. Right. and, and God and showing God's heart to empower us, not to take everything from us. That's right. That's, that's right. what the enemy does. Right. And there's no joy in that. But there's uh, yeah. Robs you, robs you completely. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. See, when I, I, to me, when I see the, when I hear about the kingdom of God, I, I, I mean, I actually see the word joy. It's all joy. Yeah. It is. It's all yeah. freedom. It's all yeah. joy. Yeah. Um, and what you're saying, what you're saying, Dana, about, you know, Calvin, about the, uh, and, and some of the reform people, um, there's no joy. There's no. no joy. They just keep on beating themselves up. There's no joy in that. That's yeah. not what God intended. And a lot of time it does lead, lead into a lordship theology belief. Oh. Where I was, what becomes self-righteous and, and before they know it they are they're very self-righteous have y'all ever been to those conferences mm-hmm. Dana maybe when you first come in, remember some of those conferences that they used to hold you know the reformers meetings and stuff and man you're talking about dry oh my god man the scripture was great the truth was great yeah. but the spirit of the place was awful man what, 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 what is theology? I don't, I don't know what really what that means. What What's is, that? What it, it's, it's, where, it's where that you, you're a believer. Let's say you smoke still or you drink. Well, Lordship Theology says if you're still sinning or you do things that are sinning, uh-huh. you're probably not saved. Uh-huh. You probably uh-huh. must endure, you know. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And it's like, wow, man. Oh, it's so oppressive. It is, man. Where's the freedom in that? What's the movie? Freedom! What was that movie? (laughs) The the irony of of Calvinism in in showing total depravity and and, uh, our our inability, I mean, then Jesus gets to be Savior. He he gets to to be the one we look to instead of ourselves and what we can what we can do in our holiness. And, and for me, it hasn't been a lot. <laughs> it's um, Boy, you hit on everything, it? even our, even our great, our, everything comes from, from Jesus. Right. And then even the gratitude of that comes from Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> we, we don't get a boast in anything. And that, right. I'm okay with that. Amen. Amen. Brother. Amen. 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 Yeah. So, uh, Ward, uh, Con and I, in conversations we've had, and we're going to give you some credit here again. Uh, but uh, I believe that you love God's sovereignty as much as anybody, and you teach it. But what I, what we were impressed with you a while back was that again, and you said it about the mercy, mercy of God, and then the, the mercy that God's people should have. You seem to have brought that balance in where I think some of that has been lost along the way. In some of the Calvinism, although doctrinally very sound, but I think that one thing has been dropped a long way. I think you picked that up and reminded people of it, and, and it's and it's very good. So we, we thank you for that, really. Well, praise the Lord on that, and and I, I praise the Lord that you saw that. Uh, and I have to say that it came about uh, through a flat nose. And what I mean by that is falling on my face. <laughs> and uh, 
you know, I, in, in the nineties, uh, it was in 89 that I first came to Sovereign Grace and I was a Lordship guy all the way up until, oh gosh, I became a preterist in 93 and some things were not seeming right to me uh, because I was seeing all these contradictions in what I was teaching. You know, I was teaching sovereign grace, but I was also teaching lordship. And I was seeing all these contradictions and I wasn't seeing lo love. I was seeing works right. as the fruit of salvation uh, rather than love for one another, mercy. You know, I didn't really get that and, until later on. Like, seriously, I mean, massive falling on my face in 97, having doubts about my faith. You know, I had been involved in the internet scene, debating conferences, all this stuff. And from, I mean, you know, I won't go into detail, but from 97 to 2007, it was a decade of darkness for me. Uh, I married, um, you know, got got married basically deceiving um, my wife as to my philosophical problems. You know, I was just going through so many struggles. I'd watched several uh, what who seemed to be devoted Christians defect from the faith, you know, and of course I, I, I'm one of those guys that obviously believes in sovereignty of God that they never had the faith, but it, it just discouraged me terribly. And my faith, I think it was God's way of showing that I was really leaning heavily on my understanding rather than wow. leaning wow. on God. Um, you know, trust in the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you know, lean not on your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. And I was leaning on my own understanding. Yes, you know, do I believe I was saved by his grace, sovereign grace? Yes, I do. But, you know, it's kind of, I kind of had sort of a Solomon episode, you know, not that I was as wise, but that uh, I, I went after knowledge. Right. And, and knowledge is good, but knowledge puffeth up. You know, First Corinthians 13. It, it makes you arrogant. And, and I really believe this. And I know some, even some Calvinists, where I probably get more Calvinists than a lot of Calvinists. Um, I really do believe that God is more concerned about humbling us and making sure we're not prideful than he is about dotting all our I's and crossing our T's. And so in all those areas where we feel like I have to dot my I's and I have to cross my T's and I have to mind my P's and Q's. Well, I believe that God will bring about failure in yeah. our idolatry. Uh, yeah. that's, in other words, yeah. in the areas that we have exalted to say, this is sort of a standard of Christianity, you know. Uh, we, we always judge people who are falling in areas that we're not follow, falling in, you know. I mean, Christians are the hardest people, you know. I mean, you know, Lorraine's gone through a, a, a situation with a brother that where all of us, you know, it'd be very easy to, to judge, very easy to judge. But when we think about how God views iniquity, how God views transgression, how God views idolatry. James 2.10, if we transgress one of the commandments, we transgress them all. There is nothing. You can think of the worst vile offense, whether it's Hitler or some guy, you know, having sex with a horse or the, the worst offense. And it's so easy for us to go, oh, I can't believe you would do that. And it is at that very moment, that man, either God wakes you up and just shakes you and says, wait a minute, look at the scriptures, recognize your frailty and that you are but dust. Or we go headlong into it. I believe that. I believe yes. all, uh, very often the very areas that we have exalted 
in our minds and created a pedestal, sort of an idol of that particular, quote, moral. And I say, quote, because it's debatable. You know, when we turned a moral into an idol, that's no longer a moral. That's an idol. That's <laughs> it's right. like, and that's why God said to the Jews, he said, when you sacrifice an ox, it's as if you cut off a dog's head. <laughs> yeah. You see, so in other words, yes, they were supposed to sacrifice an ox, but their mindset was given to the idolatry of that sacrifice. And God said, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he brings it with an evil heart? And so I, I guess what I'm getting at is that from 1997 to 2007, I did all the things that I thought only unsaved people would do. Right. Right? right. And, and it was through those things that God showed me those passages, Robert, about mercy. And, yeah. yeah. Hey, Ward, by the way, let me say from a personal standpoint, I missed you back in those days when you kind of disappeared. <laughs> Glad you're back, brother. <laughs> you're back and stronger than ever too I, I say that with personal personal feeling because I followed you a long time ago and I'm glad that you're back and you're you're, uh, you're teaching like you're teaching man it's awesome to have you back yeah, yeah. we'll second that yeah praise yeah. the Lord through you Nat yes sir <laughs> yeah they were we hard kind of meet up in the in the online debating stuff with Planet Preterist and, and uh, um, Preterist Archive and that one just uh, the, 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 the amount of, um, of uh, uh, Calvinist, what do you call it, Lordship? Or yeah, Lordship Theology. Right. Lordship Theology. It, it, it got just so brutal in those things and I'm like, I never come away from this edified. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. You know, you don't get edified when somebody calls your mama a gorilla, you know. I don't believe your mama's a gorilla. Your mama's got a mouth on the back of her neck, she chews like this. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, Dana, that is so true. And and that was one of the questions they I'm glad you brought that up. That was one of the questions that I began asking myself in all of those, you know, kind of testosterone laden debates was where's the fruit you know and it's right. not to say that it's not to say that there you know there's not occasion where we point out the negativity of a doctrine or whatever but i think sometimes we can focus on these jots and tittles and you know little horns and you know hailstones and whatever we we get so focused on these things about revelation and preterism and what happened back then that we lose sight, we lose our affection for the house yes. of God. Right. Yes. When our affection, when our love for God, it, now there's extremes. I know there's extremes. There's, you know, there's that, well, I just love God's people and there's no study of the scripture, the cross right. and the beauty of the kingdom. But man, I don't see a Wesleyan Jesus or an Arminian Jesus or a Calvinist Jesus or an Augustinian Jesus. I see a Jesus who, who like just revels and inhabits our praises. Yeah. And he, he loves us delighting in him and he delights in our praises. And his big thing is just tell people of my glory, tell people right. of my works and my salvation and my mercy and show them the mercy that I've shown you right. and you have fulfilled the law of Christ. I really believe that. It's about the intent. It's about the intent. Honestly. Yes. You know, we yeah. could argue rightly so for like in the doctrines, but when it be, but when it becomes about us being right, right, then we need to question ourselves. Wait a minute, who's getting glorified here? Am I getting glorified? <laughs> you know, seriously, it's about the intent of the heart. It really, really is. When when we, it, I, I just wish, I pray that every believer that when we get that way, because I think we all do, you know, um, that something goes on in our head or our heart. It's like God's saying gong, you know, like, like bang. Okay. Like a bell goes off or something and, and kind and we kind of get back to, Oh, wait a minute. It's about you, God, not about us. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. You preach it, sister. You <laughs> preach it. Nobody wants to listen. <laughs> We're listening, baby. We're listening. We are. Yes, we are. You know, Ward, when you talk about mercy and uh, talk about doctrine and uh, some of the the forefathers in the in the faith that is the uh, Calvinistic or Reformed faith, if you look at the uh, in Plymouth, New England, or the New England states in the 1600s, and I realize secular history has overblown probably the numbers to where it, you would think it's many more than what it really was. But even if it's just a few, what happened to those men that were, you know, Calvinistic, I thought, in New England, when they were so superstitious as they would uh, end up torturing to get an ex extract a testimony from a woman that she was a witch. And, of course, if she finally gave in to the torture and said she was, and, of course, what was what they do next to her. What happened? What kind of superstitious mindset enveloped them to, to do something like that? It, uh, it's very pu puzzling sometimes. It wasn't mercy, was it, Robert? No. no. And that's it's, uh, what you're saying, Ward. Yeah, right. I was thinking about the same thing today, Robert. That's funny that you should even mention that. I mean, do we... Um, I don't believe in progressive sanctification, but is there like some kind of progressive learning of, you know, in each generation that we learn a little bit more or we come to, I mean, is there, there has to be, I mean, because we don't burn witches to the state today. Now we just, you know, say, oh, they're new ages, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. We buy their books. Uh, yeah, we buy their books, yeah. Listen to their workout aerobics and stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think there is some to that because I don't think we quite buy the same way of the divine rights of kings, although it might have manifested itself in a little bit more tricky way. I think it's maybe not completely gone. But, but yeah, I, I think there is something to that because I've talked with my son about that where, there are seemed like there's places in history where we have seemed like we've learned from that unless unless we repeat ourselves, but we have eh, let's learn from that. We've moved on from that. But that but yes, uh, I, I think there's something to that. And like a preacher I used to know uh, said that the the, the uh, I've said it before, but the God, revelation of God's word is complete, but our understanding of it certainly is not complete. Which right. means we have our own work to do. We can't expect the reformers to have done it all, and, and they did plenty considering the time frame they lived in and what what they're contending with but should they expect to we expect them to have done it all no we should have our own work to do yeah well yeah i you know kind of related to what you're saying what lorraine had asked about the growing uh you're right i mean the bible doesn't teach like we're getting closer to christ's impeccability we are now in the image of Christ. Amen. We have yeah. his holiness. We have his righteousness. But yes, right. we do grow in knowledge and we grow in the knowledge of his grace, his character, his kingdom. And I, I don't believe that ever stops. Uh, you know, we may get Alzheimer's or dementia or whatever and what that looks like and how God works that out. I don't even want to go into it. All I know is that our life is to be characterized by a spirit of gratitude, joy, thanksgiving, um, and then, and then, and then uh, love for the house of God. Uh, you know, that said, we, I can't help but think that as we study and learn about God and his kingdom, we do grow we, we, we have our setbacks, obviously. You know, I mean, you know, just today I've had setbacks, you know, and just, uh, you know, watching sibling rivalry and, you know, and then driving that truck over Wolf Creek Pass and, and you know, people honking at you and staring at you funny and, you know, you know, and then having to take that, uh, you know, that mean dude out to the swamp and slay him, you know, stuff like that. It's just, a, <laughs> just kidding. But uh, we, we have these <laughs> moments, these moments of setbacks where <laughs> I know Danny's gone, man, I did that same thing. <laughs> uh, we, how, many, how many number ones did you give on the line? <laughs> <after? laughs> right. But I mean, you know, we, we think we're doing really well. And we have that setback. And let me tell you something. This is what I believe about setbacks. Setbacks are God's way of causing us to grow in the knowledge of his grace. I think you're right, Lord. I think that's a great point. 
And that doesn't, but, yeah, go ahead, Lori. No, I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt, but, but I, I just keep on thinking that, um, now you're talking about individual setbacks. You're just talking about the individual, but the body of Christ as a whole. Oh, I got you. generation, each generation, I think for some reason, I, I you know, uh, tell me if I'm wrong. I just feel like each generation, there's something a little bit more that is revealed. We have it all now. Don't get me yeah, wrong. I, I think you're. I think you're on the body as a body. I'm talking about as as the way maybe the world sees us, or as the the way that we see us, or we we. I, I don't know. I just. Um, I, I I just feel. Well, like Lorraine, a good a good example. The Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, they've uncovered them now. Right. Okay. So much about the culture of the Jewish Second Temple period that we never really understood. Right. And I tell you what, they don't realize it really helps preterism. <laughs> the, church, the church as a whole is going to realize that it's really starting to show yeah. you know, how correct that the kingdom now is. Yeah, yeah. And that, and revelation keeps coming. I, that's just my opinion. I, I just mean, I you know, I, I just think that um, uh, e each generation, I think, uh, the body of Christ makes a mark in one way or the other. Oh, yeah. Individually, we're complete. We're whole. We, we you know, we, we have everything that we need in him. But I think, I don't know, maybe I'm reading history wrong. I don't know. Maybe I should read history. <laughs> Ask our historian, Lorraine. Oh, that's right, Robert, our historian, right. I need well, to no, I'm not, not too much of one, really, just a little <laughs> limited part. But, but no, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think what you're saying, I think there is some kind of progress in human knowledge, although there's setbacks. But I would credit, and I would hope, then, it's the light of the gospel that really does it. Right. Because when you look at the Christian right. nations, they have been the ones that really were, if you decide where you'd like to live as far as the advancement of right. human rights. So certainly the elevation of women from being a literal domestic right. drudge to the stronger animal in the pagan societies. Right. Lord help women in those societies, but right. to the elevate to the queen of the house by, I think, the light of the scriptures. So, yeah, I really do well, think not, that, Yeah, and I'm not saying that the world gets better because it's not better. Right. Right. I'm just talking about the kingdom of God. That's all. Yeah. Well, I think there is, a, it's, with when when I was a futurist, I was I was kind of uh, on board with the world falling apart, falling apart, and uh, and kind of of the the mindset that we were getting worse and worse and worse and dumber and dumber and and all, all that kind of thing. Yeah. And and really, the opposite was coming when when I became a apprentice. I realized no, we're we are growing, you know, line upon line. <laughs> um, and we're 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 getting smarter in all this, and and God is showing, revealing more and more. So it's um, yeah. it's kind of the hope of uh, of, uh, of behind preterism, anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. preterism is one that, to me best offers that really, because if you look at these futurist eschatologies and those who would hold to them. Many of them are, are, quote, what you call very patriotic Americans. You know, they would want to fight, you know, for their country and fight against these bad influences and so forth. And yet their eschatology says these things have to happen. So their eschatology yeah, right. is, contradicts itself. Is, is That's it true. <laughs> so there, what does the scripture say about a man, about uh, 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 when you have oh, a double-minded man, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Wanting yeah. yeah. your team to win, to lose. Yeah, that's right. Well, the, the one, <laughs> <laughs> place a bet on them, place a bet on them. <laughs> you know, Jesus, Jesus gave us a promise, and he said, Upon this rock I will build my church. I knew the state of, that. of hell will not prevail. Amen. Hallelujah, right there. And that's, so, a, that's it. Yeah, and, and so we've just got to be confident in that. And God does move in waves. He does. Yes. He yes. moves in waves. And, you know, he, he said, in one place, I'm going to cause a famine, you know, not of basically food, but he said of hearing the words of the Lord. And God knows what he's doing. He, Amen. 
if, if he's going to cause a little famine in, in this particular area of the world and then cause a, a, an awakening in this area, um, it, it's going to be with the knowledge of him and his kingdom and love for one another. That's, that's what you'll see. A true awakening has the characteristics of the knowledge of God, the worship and adoration of God, the knowledge of his kingdom. And that's what it says in Psalm 145. It says, they shall speak of your power and talk of your kingdom. That's what it says. And we just happen to be, and who knows what's going on in, you know, third world nation somewhere, but we just happen to be in this awesome situation where the kingdom and grace is globalized. We get to meet here on the internet. I know. And in September, in face-to-face. Yes. Amen. Amen. I'm going to put my hand on y'all to make sure you're not a hologram. Talk <laughs> about that one, yeah. Make sure we're not holograms. Right. Hey, here's the new bumper sticker, Ward. God moves in waves, so grab your surfboard, dude, and let's catch the next one. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Wait, no, it's this one. Hey, right. I'm here all week. I'm here all week. <laughs> tip, your, tip your waitresses and bartenders, please. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you got on a, just to change a, it's a gear a little bit, if, uh, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, Lorraine, Dana, you're in the Phoenix area, and you may have heard of them. And, and you could have too, Danny, on the internet being what it is. And now you're back in our state now, award. But have you heard this fellow named Steven Anderson? No. Pastor in the, yeah, he's uh, he's made some news by some of the things he's uh, has said. Uh, yeah, well, he's re- well, real tough about divorce and marriage. If you better divorce, you better.